Good afternoon, our dear viewers. I'd like to welcome you to the show. Uh, it is a Tuesday, and indeed the time is the time that was dedicated by the management of the station, given up for your daily educational show, Somera Mudirodio. Uh, without wa wasting time, I'd like to welcome you back from the weekend. I hope everyone had a good one. We are going to be carrying on with our discussion uh, to do with the uh, Archimedes principle and the law of rotation. Uh, briefly, allow me to review what we had uh, looked at last week, where I tried to do some basic calculations uh, that required the knowledge of uh, Archimedes principle. I had also hinted about uh, the law of rotation. So today, like I promised, I'm here to do more examples on the Archimedes principle and then also uh, talk about in detail uh, the law of flotation. Uh, along me is the reference book for the ordinary level, which is uh, A.F. Abbott. Of course, that is the author. The title is Ordinary Level Physics. I mentioned last week that I will be sharing with you a page which has uh, quite a number of uh, numerical questions that require you to use the Archimedes principle and the law of flotation. So the page is 135. If there is anybody who has the book around there, you can kindly pick it up. Uh, page 135, question 12. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, numerical questions there. Uh, very interesting ones, which require us to use the knowledge of Archimedes principle, definitions of upthrust, uh, applications of the principle, as far as relative density is concerned, and then uh, also the law of flotation. However, I'm going to start by doing one more calculation on the Archimedes principle. Or, let me first talk about the law of flotation, then I wrap it up uh, with all the calculations. Remember we said that uh, uh, this states that a floating body uh, displaces its own weight of the fluid in which it floats. So, in the layman's understanding, we're saying that when a body is floating, when a body is floating in a fluid, it displaces A certain weight of the fluid which is equal to its own weight. So, uh, mathematically, we are saying that for any floating body. The weight of the body is equivalent to the weight of the fluid displaced. If I bring in the mathematical definition of weight as mass times acceleration due to gravity, then it means that the mass of the body times g must be equal to the mass of the fluid displaced uh, times g. Of course, the g's cancel out, and therefore, this implies that the mass of the body is equivalent to the mass of the fluid displaced. However, uh, we also know that 
Now the mass of the body will be its density times its volume. And then the mass of the fluid displaced will be the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid displaced. Hence, uh, according to this law, we're saying that the density of the body, volume of the body times G must be equal to the density of the fluid displaced times the volume of the fluid displaced then times G. That is, if I go with the traditional definition uh, to do with weight, but we also saw that if the Gs cancel out, then I'm remaining with only the masses. Now, using these two mathematical equations, we are seeing that we can also state the law mathematically in form of ratios of a volume and density, whereby the density of the body, uh, density of the fluid displaced divided by the density of the body is equal to the volume of the fluid displaced divided by the volume of the body. Now, when the law is stated like that mathematically, then it is true that the volume of the fluid displaced divided by the volume of the body will be equal to uh, the fraction of the body below the fluid surface, or what we shall sometimes call the fraction of the body that is submerged uh, below the fluid. Why? We know that the volume of the fluid displaced will be equivalent uh, to the volume of that part of the body which is below the water surface. So, if I have this divided by the entire volume of the body, then it means uh, this is the fraction of the volume of the body that is below the water surface. Uh, let me use this diagram to illustrate this. Uh, this is my body. Then... I'm immersing it in a liquid such that we have something like that. It is true uh, that this part of the body, this volume of the body, which is below the water surface, will be equal to the volume of the liquid displaced. So, if I have the volume of the liquid displaced divided by the entire volume of the body, then that is the fraction of the volume of the body that is submerged below the liquid surface, according to the mathematics. Uh, basically, what we have on the board right now is a summary of what we need to know about uh, the law of flotation. So it is true that in order for a body to float, then its weight must be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Assuming we tie ourselves to the body uh, floating in a liquid, then the weight of the body must be equal to the weight of the liquid that is displaced. Uh, it is from this law that the engineers are able to come up with uh, different structural designs for the ships and the yacht, of course the mega ones. Uh, they use also this law in order to calculate to what depth uh, must a particular design sink in order for it uh, to perform a smooth journey across the different water bodies. Is it an ocean? Is it a lake? Uh, is it a river? You can name it. I'm going to be using various examples in order for me to explain uh, the practical application of this to detail. Uh, but for now, uh, let me give you some time and you write this down and then you also try and uh, quickly comprehend uh, what I've just uh, discussed with you so far. Otherwise, this is the law of flotation. Uh, it's a common question. State the law of flotation. Uh, but stating it alone is not important if you don't understand uh, what the law is all about. Anybody to float, it must displace a certain weight 
of the fluid which must be equal to its own weight. That is what we mean by a floating body displaces its own weight of the fluid in which it floats. That the weight of the fluid that is displaced must be equal to the weight of the body itself. Now, the depth to which it will, uh, to which it must sink in order for it to remain floating, uh, that can be varied, uh, depending, of course, on its weight. So, I'm going to first do a quick numerical example that requires the application of this law. And then I'll move on and describe an experiment to verify it. So my question reads that a piece of cork, rubber cork, uh, of volume 100 cubic centimeters is floating in water. If the density If the density of the cork is 0 0.25 grams uh, per centimeter cubed, full stop, calculate the volume of the cork immersed in the water. So, uh, using the law of flotation, we're seeing that the density of the cork, volume of the cork times G, must be equal to the density of the water, uh, volume of the water times G. Uh, the Gs will cancel out, then I remain with density of the cork, volume of the cork, a density of water displaced times the volume of water displaced. So from this, I have that the density of the cork is 0 0.25. I multiplied with uh, 100, its volume. A density of water, uh, since I'm dealing with the mass in grams, or the units here have uh, already been written in terms of grams and centimeters cube. So I want to go with the density of water as one gram per centimeter cube in order for me to match the units which are on the left-hand side. So this is going to be 1 times volume of the water displaced. So from here, we're seeing that the volume of the water displaced is now at 25 cubic centimeters. So, this is the volume of the water displaced. But, we know that uh, the volume of water displaced is equal to the volume of the cork immersed in the water or below the water surface. Uh, because of this, because of what I explained here, using this diagram. I say that whatever is below will be equivalent to the volume of the liquid displaced. So here, I'm discovering that uh, as a result of a cork of that volume and that density, this is how much water is displaced in order for it to remain floating. But this is equivalent to the volume of the cork that will be immersed in the water. So from this, I want to deduce that Uh, hence, the volume of the cork immersed 
in the water is 25 cubic centimeters. That would be my solution. I'm using Archimedes principle in order for me uh, to deduce that solution. My question two, let me also share with you this. Uh, this is my first numerical example. I've tried to ensure that uh, I go about this topic in a manner that I'm presenting to you all the possible questions that you may come across uh, during the exam. That's why I started by stating Archimedes principle and helping you uh, understand what it's all about. I also got entertaining at some point whereby I shared with you uh, the story that shows the origin of uh, Archimedes and how he came about uh, to discover the, this principle. Uh, then I also tried to do some numerical calculations and of course I also talked about the verification process of Archimedes principle. Then I moved on and talked about its application in determining the relative density of both a solid and a liquid. I left an assignment for you uh, of which I would like to congratulate uh, all the people who have tried to forward me uh, their procedures as far as determining the relative density of a solid is concerned. Then I'm giving you the law of flotation, showing you its application in some numerical questions, from which I'm also going to go on and uh, discuss the verification process with you guys. So, if you've been following me, then indeed, you've at least learned something. If not, you've perfected uh, the theories of Archimedes and the application of this principle in determining the relative density of both a solid and a liquid, and then also uh, the law of flotation. So, my other example, I'm going to be picking it from our reference book, uh, the Abbott. And it reads that if the relative density of ice If the relative density of ice is 0 0.92 and that of seawater is 1.025, comma, what fraction What fraction of an iceberg floats above the surface? So this is the Roman part A of it. And then part B. Uh, let me spare part B for now. Let me do uh, this first part. So, we are being given relative densities this time. Relative density of ice zero point nine two. Relative density of sea water one point zero two five. So what fraction of an iceberg floats above uh, the surface of the seawater? Of course, that's what they're referring to. Uh, what they are, in, in case you're wondering, what's the origin of this question? 
the geography tells us that on certain water bodies, uh, especially those which are close uh, to the Atlantics or which are close to the poles where it is usually snowing, if not, we can also take an example of uh, a winter period whereby most of the water bodies, depending on their location, can also form ice or catch an ice layer up to a certain depth. Then when the summer kicks in, the ice starts melting and then it leaves us with, uh, of course it does not all melt at once, so it can leave us with uh, packs or bags of ice. Uh, the ice bag, B-E-R-G, uh, the geographers know. Uh, the details of this. So we are looking at such an iceberg which is floating. But to bring it uh, uh, to bring out to bring it out more, I don't know how many of us have watched the movie Titanic, especially at uh, that point uh, where the ship crashed, but the crashing was as a result of it trying to dodge a very large pack of ice. So you can imagine something like that. We have a giant iceberg that is floating on the water body. And the question is, in our case, uh, given the relative density of ice and the seawater is what fraction is floating above the surface. Now, we know that for flotation, the density of the ice times the volume of the ice must be equal to the density of the seawater times the volume of the seawater. I've chosen to ignore the acceleration due to gravity because it will cancel out like it did in my previous example. So I'm going direct to this. If I know the relative density of ice, then it means I can get the density of ice. Why? The definition of relative density is the ratio of the density of a substance with the density of water. So if I know the relative density of a substance, then it means that its density is its relative density multiplied with the density of water. So here, density of ice will be 0 0.92 density of water. Then also here, uh, density of seawater will be 1.025 times the density of ordinary water. When I bring this here, I'm going to have a ratio of density of ice over density of seawater uh, being equal to the volume of the seawater divided by the volume of ice. Volume of seawater displaced as a result of this iceberg floating on it. I want to be very clear uh, about that. What I'm calling the volume of the seawater is actually the volume of the seawater that is displaced as a result of an iceberg of this relative density or this density floating in it. And we know that that volume also represents the volume of the iceberg that is below the water surface, the seawater surface. However, our question is asking us what fraction of the iceberg floats above? So, uh, when I substitute here, I'm going to have 0 0.92 uh, density of ordinary water, 1.025 density of ordinary water. This must be equal to the volume of the seawater divided by the volume of ice. This information I don't have, but I know that this is the fraction of the iceberg below the seawater surface. So, if I want to know the fraction which is above, I'm just going to basically take 1 minus this, according to the ratio theory. So, uh, this will translate uh, into 0 0.92 divided by 1.025. Let me try and work this out on my calculator. Point nine two divided by 
1.025. So uh, this is around uh, 0 0.8975. For the small places, 0 0.8976. Now, this is the fraction that is below. This is fraction below the seawater. So, fraction above will be 1 minus the fraction below. So I have around 0 0.1024. Of course, I've not been able to give it as a fraction uh, because I'm not using a scientific calculator, but people who are using a scientific calculator out there, you can help me and deduce it uh, as a proper fraction. Uh, this is 0 0.1024. So this is the fraction of the iceberg that is floating above. That is floating above the surface. I've tried to tackle two issues as far as uh, the calculations are concerned. Number one, I'm introducing to you the idea which I had already talked about uh, in my introductory work, fraction submerged or the fraction below the water surface. This is it. But then I'm also bringing to your attention that we can also ask the fraction that is floating above. And now that will be just one minus uh, the fraction which is submerged or the fraction which is below the water surface uh, using the, the knowledge of uh, fractions in mathematics. So if, if I know what is below, then it means that what is above will just be the whole minus what is below. So that is why I'm doing one minus what is below. And then this will give me the fraction that is above the water surface. Uh, of course, I've already apologized. I'm not using a scientific calculator, but if you're using a scientific calculator, I'm quite sure that maybe you can come up with a, with a proper fraction around here or improper fraction. And then also here, you can be able to deduce uh, this figure in the fraction form, something out of something. So, those are also some of the calculations that you're going to come across uh, in the exams and also from the various uh, past papers that are requiring you to use the knowledge of the law of flotation in order for you to answer the questions that follow. Now, before I go and uh, wrap up uh, the entire topic of uh, Archimedes principle and the law of flotation, uh, let me talk about the verification process because there is also a particular set of procedures which you can go through in the lab and then we are able to indeed prove or verify the fact that if a body is to float then it must displace a certain volume of the liquid in which it is floating that is of equal weight to its own weight. So I'm going to look at now uh, the verification process. to put a heading experiment to verify
verify uh, the law of flotation. So, what am I going to do in this case? Uh, because we want to prove that a certain volume that has been displaced is of equal weight to the weight of whatever is floating on the water surface, uh, there are two things that I can use. I can use the same set of apparatus as those uh, in the that we used when we were trying to verify the Archimedes principle. Or, uh, of course, those were the measuring cylinder. Sorry, a Eureka can. I think we had a Eureka can. Or the overflow can. And then we also had a beaker below its spout. Whereby the displaced liquid can flow into the beaker. And then we take this and measure it on the triple beam. And then also subtract away the weight of the empty beaker and then arrive at the weight of the we arrive at the weight of the of the water that has been displaced or i can use a measuring cylinder or a beaker that has calibrations on it pour in a certain liquid e.g water assuming we're in our, our domestic lab the traditional lab setting I bring a test tube, I first of all measure and record its weight using the triple beam when it's empty, then I slowly introduce the test tube into the water. After that, I get pellets uh, of uh, lead, those are also usually available in the lab. I start adding the shots of lead the lead pellets. Now, I add them up to a point whereby the beaker, sorry, the test tube is in position to float vertically. Now, when that happens, I'll come and record the volume of the water that has been displaced. After which, I'll remove the test tube and then again weigh it together with the shots of lead that I introduced. The, dis the observation that we shall make in the lab is that the weight of the beaker plus the lead shots will be equal to the calculated weight of the volume displaced. Because the volume of the water displaced, that one I will calculate. Sorry, uh, the weight of the water displaced, that one I will calculate. Since I will be knowing the volume, I will go with the uh, standard density of water as 1,000 or 1 gram per centimeter cube, depending on how I've recorded my volume. And then I'll be able to know what was the weight of the water displaced. But the observation will be that the two weights will be equal. Uh, this is what I'm saying. I have my calibrated container here. It can be a measuring cylinder or it can be a beaker. I have water in it. And then in fact I'm going to record its initial volume, V naught. After that, I'm going to introduce a test tube. When I introduce a test tube, definitely the volume of the water will change because this alone is going to try and displace a certain volume. But it may not be in position to remain floating vertically. So my aim is to try and have it floating vertically, which means that I want to start introducing more weights inside here. And I say that these weights are usually are uh, pellets of lead. Now, as I add more weights, even the volume of the water displaced also keeps on increasing. So I'm going to assume that it will finally float when the, when the volume of the water has shifted from this point to this point. 
Uh, let me call that VF. Now it is standing vertically. We are then going to remove this and take it to a spring balance. And then we shall also record its weight. So, the reading of the spring balance will be the weight that was floating on the water. Then, the fact that I know the volume of the water displaced, which will be the value Vf minus V0, if I multiply by the standard density of water, it means I can also be able to know the weight of the water that was displaced. Observations are going to show us that this value of the calculated weight of the vol of the volume of the water displaced will be equal to the weight of the test tube along with the pellets that were added to it in order for it to remain standing or floating vertically in the water. So let me try and uh, write this down in a few steps as governing procedures. Uh, step one we are saying that uh, uh, get a beaker pour in some liquid, maybe specific some water, up to a certain volume V0. Step two, gently introduce a test tube into the beaker. Step three, slowly add lead shots into the beaker up to a point when it can remain floating vertical. Step three, record the new volume, comma VF of the water in the beaker. Then the next step, I remove the test tube and measure its weight. I'll call my WB using spring balance of course here any any weight measuring ex, uh, instrument can be used uh, depending on what is available for you in the lab step four calculate the weight of the water displaced as uh, weight of the water displaced will be uh, the final volume minus that times the density of the water. Where is the standard volume of water? Now in our conclusion, we're going to say that it will be observed that at the value WB will be equal uh, to the value 
WH2O that was calculated. Now this indeed verifies the law of flotation. Why? We're discovering that the weight that was floating in the beaker is equal to the weight of the water that was displaced. And that is exactly what the law of flotation is all about. <laughs> that a floating body displaces its own weight of the fluid in which it floats. So, uh, this wraps up uh, the entire topic of uh, Archimedes' principle and the law of flotation. I'll try to give as many questions as I can. But lastly, uh, let me share with you one more numerical question uh, that will probably require us uh, to use both Archimedes principle and then also maybe uh, the law of flotation. Uh, but because of time, I may not be able to do two examples. But I'm leaving you an assignment uh, from uh, the Abbott page 135, page 136. Uh, those who do not have this reference book, uh, you can reach me on my email or on the school kit app. Uh, just a kind reminder. Uh, Lutakin at gmail.com or on the school kit app under the forum of uh, uh, BBS Somera Mudrilorio Olive Physics. I'll be able to share with you uh, this page that contains these questions. There are quite a number of them, and all of them have surfaced somewhere at some point uh, in the exams. So, other methods of uh, verifying the law of flotation you will come across, I'm quite sure. People who have the ordinary level physics by Tom Duncan, the O level Tom Duncan, uh, he explains the verification process using the overflow can and then also the beak at the other end. Uh, using that arrangement, like the one which I used to verify the Archimedes principle. So, in these few minutes, let me read for you this question. Our next topic uh, will depend on the tally that I'm going to get from the few people who have been giving us feedback and uh, giving me suggestions on what topic to do next. But I know very many people have been asking me to try and do general revision of the senior one, senior two physics are uh, using a certain set of questions. Others are asking me to tackle the topic of uh, magnetism or electricity. but that one uh, we shall yet decide uh, with my audience. So the question reads that a cube of wood of volume 0 0.2 meters cubed And this the 600 kilograms per meter cube. Is placed in a liquid of density. Eight hundred kilograms per meter cubed, full stop. What fraction of the volume of the wood would be immersed in the liquid? That is Roman 1. What fraction of the volume of the cube would be submerged in the liquid? And then Roman 2. 
what force must be applied to the cube so that the top surface of the cube the cube uh, so that the top surface of the cube is on the same is on the same level as the liquid surface So we have a cube of that volume. I have my cube of that volume, then I'm letting it float in a liquid. That is my case one. So for flotation, using the law of flotation, volume of the cube, density of the cube, volume of the liquid, density of the liquid. The reverse is true. I'm twisting it this time, starting with volume, and then bringing on density. So they're asking me what fraction of the volume of the cube would be submerged in the liquid. And we know that that fraction is the fraction of uh, volume of the liquid displaced divided by the volume of the cube. And this will be uh, the density of the cube divided by the density of the liquid. So that fraction is the value. Uh, density of the cube is 600 our density of the liquid is 800 so the fraction of the cube that is submerged is definitely uh, the value uh, 3 out of 4 That is the fraction submerged. Now they're saying that we can apply a force to the cube so that the top surface of the cube is on the same level as the liquid surface. Which means that diagrammatically, this is what I'm having now. But there is a force here, F. Of course, there is the weight of the cube down, a W. But then, here, there will also be another force, up thrust. as predicted by Archimedes' principle. Body is wholly or partially immersed in a fluid. It experiences an upthrust which is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Now, in these other parts, by the way, I don't know if people have managed to discover that even when this one is partially it must such that it remains floating. It is experiencing an upthrust which is equal to the weight of the body itself. 
in the law of flotation, they are telling us that the uthrust that a body will experience if it is to remain floating must be equal to its own weight. Because even here, uthrust is present. But in this case, uthrust is equal to the weight. Now, here, if I'm to study case 2, I have three forces. I have a force F, which I'm looking for. Then I also have the weight acting downwards. These two are acting downwards. But still, there's an uthrust which is present that is trying to push this to go back up. So, if this is Roman 1, in Roman 2, I want to say that F plus W must be equal to U. And I'm calling U uthrust. I'm calling W uh, the weight of the cube. And then I'm calling the force F, the required force that I'm being asked, that must be applied in order for the situation to look like that. So this force F is indeed the upthrust minus the weight of the cube. So this will be the value density of the liquid displaced volume of liquid displaced times G minus weight of the cube, uh, which is uh, its density times volume times G. I'm choosing to write it like this because I already know these terms. I know the volume of the cube. I know its density. I know the density of the liquid, but now I don't know the volume of the liquid. But according to what I have, if this is wholly submerged, then it means that the volume of the liquid displaced will be equal to the volume of the cube. So, I want to conclude this In this case, uh, the volume of liquid displaced is equal to the volume of the cube. So the force F that I'm looking for will be the density of the liquid, which is 800. Volume of the liquid displaced, uh, which is 0 0.2. Why? Because it is equal to the volume of the cube. Uh, multiplied by acceleration due to gravity, which is 10, minus... Density of the cube, which is 600, multiplied with uh, 0 0.2, and then also multiplied with 10. So what I have here uh, is uh, 200, 800 minus this. These are common terms, multiplied with 0 0.2, multiplied with 10. Uh, this will be 2. So this force is around 400 newtons. That is the force that must be applied. I hope my mathematics is correct. Yeah. Around 400 newtons must be applied. So, uh, that is another unique question. It's one of the technical ones, although not so much complicated. Uh, that you can go through this you come across uh, in any of the past papers or even the question bank itself uh, because of time allow me end today's lesson at this point i hope that all those people who have been following us uh, since the beginning of the show you have managed to learn something and kindly i would like to encourage you and advise you to not lose hope Yes, the pandemic is here, and nobody knows when schools will reopen, but learning must continue. Do not give up under the disguise after all. There is no more schooling. No, that is not the case. Anytime from now, the Ministry of Education, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, will come out and give us a certain date, which is unknown. And the mere fact that it is unknown must keep us busy. What if they say that we should resume uh, next month in October? Are we going to go back empty heads? Or what if they say we go back next week? Does it mean that we should just go back to ground zero? So kindly, uh, keep watching the show, keep following us, and may the good Lord bless you all. I wish you the very best of this week, and until next week, bye-bye.
Somera mudiro lyo nge wagidwa bosomese zo mwana wo masomero ka Janan Schools omuri campus ye bombo kalule neye kabalagala towa na bwera likirivu bonna